Tack och välkommen tillbaka. Um, we are changing languages, so uh, this time it's in English. I hope you're all prepared and uh, brought your glossary. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, going to read the introduction uh, uh, of uh, Richard Dussel. He's a, a big data evangelist, research fellow, big data labor laboratory in the Department of Computing and Maths at the University of Derby. Um, in his uh, intro, it says that uh, he has taken a leading role in the field of governance in the Department of Electronics, Computing and Maths at the uh, University of Derby. He's used the principle of governance in teaching big data and analytics and blockchain over the last year. Each year, his final year students research, research and critically evaluate some element of new leading edge technologies against governance principles. In 2017 and 18, they researched and critically evaluated applications of advanced analytics and blockchain applications with some very significant conclusions. Uh, prior to working at the university, he worked 30 years at Rolls-Royce Aerospace with experience in project finance and project management. So, uh, in the time of uh, blockchain, big data and robotics, uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, is this recording now? Yeah. Uh, we're recording it, so it'll be on my YouTube channel the next day or so, and I'll let Hannah uh, know that where it is, uh, so she could let you have the address. And I'm also putting up a PDF copy of the presentation with all the notes uh, for you to uh, have a look at as well. And you'll find that the what I actually say will be very different this session from last session, so because it's not scripted. Now, as finance people, you're looking after the money behalf of the company and ultimately the shareholders. So you want to get as much value, bang for your buck, value for your buck as you possibly can. So that's what I'm going to be looking at is you as leaders of the, these aspects in your organizations. Now the forum is actually today is about those three subjects. I took those the uh, from the program and put them into Google Translate and it came up with some sen look, sensible looking English. So <laughs> AI and finance, blockchains and growth and business performance. So they're kind of the sort of things I'm interested in anyway. So I'll be looking briefly at leadership. What does it mean? What, what is it all about? Then I shall move on to analytics and then I shall finish off Depends how quickly I get through different sections. I might have a little bit more time on blockchain this time around. Then you can look at the earlier one for what I said about analytics uh, on the other session. Now, management and leadership are both required, but they are very, very different. Managing is about getting things organized and done, and too many organizations have people like that. They go in all sorts of directions and you kind of need six di different sheepdogs to try and get everybody going. And you could call the sheepdogs the project managers, I guess. Or the project managers are the sheepdogs. But leadership works differently. It's about getting your people, getting your teams to go in a particular direction. You will probably still need managers kind of in the background getting things done because a truly inspirational leader may not also have the um, attributes for effective management um, they have the ideas and they actually rely on someone back there to get stuff done but leadership is kind of interesting and it's why in a sense i'm here because i'm here because i had a very very inspirational sort of leader who kind of gave me my head to change the way I taught, change the way I did almost everything. And as a result of some of the videos I was putting up from my lectures, I got contacted by one of the uh, management events guys up in Finland to go and give a talk down in Barcelona a couple of years ago. And since when, I've been to about five or six last year and a couple already this year here. 
And that's as a result of having an inspirational leader. In, the, in fact, the dean of the faculty. Now, I find it quite difficult when looking for stuff about leadership to find this about inspiration. This was actually one of the best ones I could find about <coughs> leaders have vision, passion, they walk the talk, they communicate, they're good at communication, and they have courage. And as we know, these are all really, really important things. We need to have a leader with a vision of where he or she wants the organization to go. We need them to have passion, to be enthusiastic and you know, really, really try and convey what it is that, about the situation, about their vision, that they want everybody to follow along with. Because if they can't communicate, if they don't have passion, and they just talk in a boring monotone, no one's going to follow them. They've got to have that body language that helps to convey that message, does that communication. That they understand how the people they're communicating to work, how they believe, the, the types of language that they connect with. Yes, of course, if you're leading change in a new direction, yeah, you're going to need courage as well. So here are the four or five things. Oh, and you need to walk the talk, one of the things that makes our workforces most cynical about our ideas for change is if they say, here's one set of rules that you guys are going to do, oh, but they don't apply to me. I'm the boss, I can do what I like. So, to be an effective leader, therefore, you have to have that walking the talk. But is that enough? No, I think you've got to have other attributes, such as inspiration. You've got to inspire your people. You've got to trust them. You've got to give them the right tools so that they can do the things you want them to do. But you only tell them what you want to have achieved. You don't need to tell them how to do it. Out of the um, control and com uh, competency, clarity, ownership field of uh, military training, this is a fundamental part of military training of officers. Give them the tools so they can assess the situation. They can have a look at the user questions to find the right solution. The top right hand corner, it doesn't matter whether it's a bridge or a boat or whatever, they will work it out for you if you've told them what the task is, not how to do it. So leadership is about empowerment, giving people the tools that they need, trusting that they will do things right. And if they make, make a mistake, well, they're going to learn from it, aren't they? And as long as they learn from it, mistakes don't matter ultimately that much. Now, now we know what leadership is basically about. It's getting your teams to go in the right direction that you feel may have had, had input from other places as well. But that's the direction we're going. And they will fall in and do stuff and do it very, very well. As we move into the more technological side, the things that are happening around us that are eating money, how do we get that value? As leaders, how do we work out of all of these wondrous new technologies which are being sold to us as being far better than sliced bread ever was, how do we filter out the bits that are going to work for us? And the answer is, I and your consultants will never give you the right answer. You have all the knowledge in your own organization. You need people to give you the questions. And that's what I'm going to be doing today. It may sound cynical. Hey, I've been in the business now for 45 years. I've seen quite a lot. It might sound like cynicism, which means don't bother. It's actually skepticism, which is convince me. Here are the questions I want answered. Now convince me that your new whatever it is, machine learning, robotics, AI, analytics, predictive analytics, blockchain, or even the newest one that came out yesterday, the hash graph, which replaces the blockchain, perhaps. All of these things are new things which are trying to get money off, your, off you, basically. 
And some of them are, if you choose them carefully, if you ask all of the right questions, will deliver very significant benefits on occasion. I want you to be able to find those occasions where you will get a decent return. Lots of questions. And the examples I'm going to be giving in all the way through are about where things aren't working quite as well, which gives you an idea about the types of questions that you really need to be thinking about to get that business value you want. For the last three or four of these events, I've been talking about GDPR, because that was back in autumn last year. Just to remind you, it's there. And it has relevance because some of you will, be, will have systems where you're using personal information and making decisions about will you give them a loan, will you sell them an insurance policy, give them a mortgage, or whatever. <coughs> there are a few little consequences that GDPR has that are important. And I guess most of your um, lawyers are already busy telling you, but one of the ones that's important is not about how you look after their data, your client's data, or customer's data, or how you get consent for stuff. It's about use of advanced analytics for making profiling and making decisions. It's the algorithmic transparency requirement of GDPR. The fact that we have to be able to explain to our clients and customers why the machine made that decision. The fact that they can come and say, you've got to give me an explanation in words of half a syllable as to why the machine made that decision. Particularly the ones which are adverse, I know. I want to start with an interesting look at the success rates of IT projects over the last, well, since 1994. Collected by a consultancy in the USA called the Standish Group uh, with their chaos reports, with a survey to CIOs, about 50,000 CIOs a year. The interesting line, okay, the bottom line here is the failures and we're now leveling out about 20% of all IT projects fail outright. These ones now have, we've got somewhere like 45, 50% of projects are challenged late over budget and get, deliver some business value. The interesting one is the blue line and then this line. The blue line was successful project on time to budget uh, delivering the contracted for functionality. But CIO said, but you can't judge it on that because things change, the world is now in the ultra fast moving to, uh, period, and so the, the world doesn't stop while we get our um, work done. So and things change. So they said, we would prefer to see on time to budget delivering business value, expecting that would increase the success rate of projects. And as you can see, it dropped the success rate by 10%. So at the moment, we're running at around about 30% of projects are on time to budget and delivering business value. Were you aware of that rate, folks? What are the consequences for your organizations the fact that only 30% of the IT projects you go for are going to deliver business value? We spend $3 trillion a year worldwide on IT, roughly speaking. A survey a couple was published a month and a half ago shows that 85% or thereabouts of people using IT spend an hour a day moving data from one system to another because they're not efficiently connected or they don't work very well. Working it out across the working population, roughly speaking, we're losing $6 trillion a year of lost productivity because of our IT systems aren't good enough. Another trillion or so for security failures and those challenge and fail projects, we spend three trillion to waste seven trillion dollars, 10% of GDP. Kind of an interesting position, folks. We get data from everywhere. We aren't always sure of how accurate it is or which data is or is not accurate. And the one on the right-hand side is a GPS tracker sitting still in my conservatory for 24 hours taking a reading every second. 
And I can guarantee the tracker did not move. Now, if you're trying to send, if your costs are trying to send or start by sending uh, adverts to your mobile phones, 25 meters doesn't matter very much. The problem is that about 10%, based on the evidence I've got, that says it goes anything up to 40 to 1800 kilometers away. There's another survey which says 15% of all uh, locations used for the location target adverts is more than 100 kilometers. Go figure. That has reputational uh, consequences. Most of us don't really know what data we've got in our organizations, let alone what we can get out of uh, social media and so on. Our data scientists are terribly con uh, keen on using something called clustering. Only it does that and confuses or clusters uh, espresso and cappuccino. It's coffee, hey? I'm not going to give you a cup of tea, but you and I know that cappuccino and espresso are somewhat different. But so analytics clustering technology almost inevitably will put them together. Hilarious when you see it like that. But if you are using clustering technology on your client base, I wonder what's happening. What questions do you ask of your data scientist to make sure you don't make a really stupid mistake like that? Teaching uh, vision systems to recognize enemy and, foreign, uh, enemy and friendly tanks. Learned all about the backgrounds and nothing about the tanks. We have problems with <coughs> vision systems looking at face recognition. They are Racist. They don't see black female faces at all. It is ever so quick and simple, and various people have told me that I've got this right here. It's so easy to use machine learning to here's all the data, tell me how it works, and go make the decisions. You can do that over a weekend or two or three weeks if you've got decent data. But you cannot explain it under GDPR rules to your clients, your customers. To do that, you have to do the traditional form of software development. That on the right is compliant with GDPR because you can explain exactly where your client failed. On this point and this point, and two together equals failure. On that side, well, there's a thousand parameters in the predictive model and it makes a decision. You can't do that under GDPR. But that's quick. But that one, Probably takes a year, a million euros to get it done properly. There's no contest, is it? Quick and cheap on the left, but uncompliant. Nasty and dirty on the other side. And you aren't allowed to have that decision. Your testing needs to be improved, your data quality on needs to be much improved. So what's blockchain about? It's well, you're all accountants, or sorry, finance people, so you know about how an accounting system works, double entry bookkeeping, and you have a data journal, don't you, that keeps track of every movement. That is all that a blockchain is. It's your journal. It's a little bit secure, and it's a bit sort of uh, protected from uh, being changed. In fact, it's totally unchangeable. But that is all the blockchain is. It is the journal. Nothing more, nothing less. And you would not run your accounting system and your companies on the journal, would you? Item one. The thing is, it's then that journal is replicated on all the servers involved in the system, all the different organizations. So if the 10 banks are participating in a Ripple-based uh, system, there's a complete copy of that journal in every single one of the banks. It can become quite expensive and difficult, but it's safe from a single point of failure. It's decentralized, so there's no one person or one group of people in control of it, which is supposed to be, or can be, a benefit. It can support asset digitization. You know, things like Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, we know that's an asset. All money is that form of asset. But it can be used for ownership of other sorts of assets, like houses. It can be used for notarization, in the sense of per identifying documents which have, have been changed or have not been changed. And it can prove that that document is no, has not been changed in its life. It can do all sorts of interesting things. The point
thought about blockchain, certainly the proof of work sort for the public untrusted blockchains like Bitcoin, it solves the problem of how do we trust those transactions? How do I know that the money I'm getting from that person over there, who I've never come across before, hasn't also spent that same Bitcoin somewhere over there? It provides a solution to the Byzantine General's problem, which is you, how, how do you prove your messages have or have not been changed, Byzantine General's problem. It's a mathematical concept, but it's almost fundamental to the untrusted public blockchains. Now, most of you are probably not going to be going near those. You'll be going to the private trusted blockchains where there are different issues. But in essence, they are less expensive to run. They are less... Um, resource consumptive. But they are there to get rid of the intermediaries. That is the aim. And Bitcoin was created, the cryptocurrencies, to get rid of people like Visa and Barclay Card and the banks who just get in the way and take your money off you um, when you want to pay someone over there. The fact that under Bitcoin you have to pay 3% at the exchange mark at each entry into the Bitcoin environment through the exchanges and 3% when you take your Bitcoins out and transfer them into fiat currency uh, is, is quietly forgotten. Whereas if I'm paying with a credit card, the worst I can get if I pay in a Krona here uh, on my sterling uh, Visa card is about 2.5-3%. I don't want to pay twice. I want to get it into pounds and then into Bitcoin, sorry, and then into Krona. That kind of strikes me as there's a new intermediary who is taking even more money out of the system than the banks do at the moment. And so when you look at blockchain applications, you need to think, are those intermediaries who are allegedly going to be got rid of actually performing a valuable um, function? These, uh, all the banks with our credit and debit cards and so on, the intermediaries are actually very valuable because if I lose my credit card, I can get a new one quite quickly. If I lose my credit debit card, well, I get a new one. If I forget my PIN, they can give me a new PIN. If it's on blockchain, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or whatever, I lose my, or forget, my um, private key or my ID, I have lost all of those assets tied to it. It could be my house, it could be um, cryptocurrency. Currently, what, about 17 million bitcoins have been mined. 4 million have been permanently lost because people have lost access to their wallets. They've lost their passwords, they've lost their IDs. They've thrown away their hard drives. So, disintermediation is a bit of an issue that needs to be questioned very, very carefully. Blockchain is simple. It's just like a ledger, your journal. Account one, two account two, and something in the middle, which could be anything. The digital uh, payload can be anything you want to make it as you design your blockchains. Lots and lots of applications. I suspect that some of the most interesting ones to people here are things like uh, intellectual property, perhaps, uh, and supply chain. Supply chain is getting a lot of attention at the moment. But because they think they could, it is being say, uh, claimed, it, will, it speeds things up, it gets rid of a lot of paper, and it avoid, helps to avoid fraud. However, remember, only, it is only once the data is in the blockchain that it is going to be secure. Humans are remarkably inventive, as we probably all know, to find ways around things, and to, if they want to commit fraud, they will find ways of doing it. It's getting it out from us people into the blockchain where you need to really think hard about are you solving the problem at all. And then all these challenges here are the ones that my students found for me over the last few weeks. And there are quite a lot there that we need to ask questions about. These are some of the questions you will need to ask if you feel you're pressured into investigating blockchain. Now the thing that you need to do is first of all to reduce the number of projects to get to choose those 30% that's worth investing on in. Get rid of the others. Use the money and the time and the resources you would have been using on them to work on the one project out of three that really is going to give you value. Start small. 
you really need to be careful about going big scale, uh, big scale with your projects, whether it's blockchain or whether it's analytics and machine learning. Start small experimentally. When you find something that is beginning to give you value, then you can start thinking about the full business case to go into the big project. So, just to conclude, where will you lead? How will you lead in terms of bringing in some of these truly powerful technologies which you very, very briefly skirted over today, so that your company, your organization, gets the maximum business value out of every kroner that your company spends on IT and systems and new technology. Find the right questions, and I think that you will find value for your organizations. Thank you very much. I should be outside for the next hour or two if you want to come and have a chat about things with me. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Jag vill att ni tar en titt på er agenda i mobilservicen. Det är några som kommer att ha one-to-one-möten med lösningsleverantörerna i andra salen. Har ni inget möte så sitt kvar så ska vi alldeles strax börja med presentation nummer två. Vi ska bara vänta in de sista.